this morning. God, we ask that you would just move and minister in the rest of this service. Let your will be done here in connections as it is in heaven. Anoint our pastor, God. Anoint every ear to hear. Prepare our heart to receive your word, God. God, we just want to offer up a sacrifice of praise this morning, an acceptable sacrifice, God. Just have your way and your will. We love you. Be glorified here this morning. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here today. We love that you're here. If you're a visitor, welcome. We love you. Um, this is the best church around. Um, get out. Just get out in the aisles and greet somebody and tell them it's good to see them. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, band, for leading us in worship today. I, something's in my heart right now, and I, I just feel like I need to share this. So this is not a smooth, smooth transition here, but uh, I want to do this. This is something that hit me this morning before service, and I don't know who this is for. It may have been for me, but I want to share it with you this morning. Just a little nugget that's here. A couple of phrases that I, I felt. If you're guests with us, first of all, we're glad you're here today. We, we have no visitors, only guests, and we're thrilled to have you here today. But uh, this is what God put in my spirit this morning. Some of us, some of you, some of us, we're together, family, need to learn to pray God's word over our lives. You need to say it. You need to speak it. You need to pray it. We speak a lot of things over our life. I wish this and... You know, I want that, and if only I had this. But how many of us pray the Word of God? There's life in the Word of God. The Bible says the, that God is the Word, and the Word was God. Is that right? And, and the Bible also says that there's life in the blood. All those are the same thing. The blood of Christ is God. And there's life in the blood. And the Word of God is God. And so if we pray the Word of God over our lives, we're speaking life into our lives. Amen? That's the first part. second part is some of you need to run towards your destiny. I don't know who this is for. Like I said, it may have been just for me. We tend to keep waiting on it to happen. When it, it, it's going to come. My ship's going to come in one day. Am I right? Run towards your destiny. When you're running towards something, that means you have a passion for trying to achieve what's out in front of you. You're trying to reach that. You're trying to uh, obtain that goal. Not waiting on it to happen. Run towards your destiny. And the last part of this, not what I'm preaching this morning, but the last part of that. Is simply this. Stop making God as small as your biggest problem. We limit God in our lives. We don't pray the word over our lives. We don't run towards the calling and the destiny that God created us for. We just, we just accept the good enough and we make God as small as our biggest thing that we're facing. How can we get over this mountain, so to speak? I can never accomplish this. I can never achieve that. And we limit God to the biggest thing in our life. When God's got everything in control, 
Amen? Just a little nugget here this morning just to say, God, feed my soul. And I wanted to give that to you this morning. He put that in my heart this morning. And I, again, I, I felt like I just need to share that. I wrote it down at the back of my notes, but I felt like it needed to happen right now. Pray the Word of God. Run towards your destiny. And stop making God as small as your biggest problem. There's a message that's going to be birthed out of that that's going to come. I know it is. But God wants to speak that into you today. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for being here again. I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready to wait upon you with our tithes and offering. Uh, and and we've got a couple announcements we're going to show. Let's pray over the offering. As they pass the basket, we're going to run our top five video. But Father, thank you for this wonderful day. For those that have chosen to be in your house today at this location, this place. Lord, I ask your blessing upon their life physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, in every shape, Lord, let your power and your anointing flow in their lives. We thank you for today. And Father, bless this seed that's been planted into your kingdom. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Please watch our top five this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connections Church. My name is JJ, and you are watching the top five to let you know what's going on and what's coming up. If this is your first time visiting our church, we want you to feel at home like part of the family. And we also want you to know what's most important to us, and that is our mission statement, to connect people to God and connect people to people. And for our next announcement, parents, if you have high school students living in your home, we want you to know that tonight at 5 p.m. here at Connections Church, we are having our youth service. We're going to have worship, we're going to bring them a word, and we're also going to just hang out and have a great time. So bring them here 5 p.m. today. And for our next announcement, this one goes to all the ladies. October 3rd and October 17th, we will be having our women's Bible study. It will be here at Connections Church, and you do not want to miss these Bible studies. So be here, put it in your calendar, October 3rd, October 17th, 7 p.m. And for our next announcement, this one goes to all the men of the church. October 17th, 7 p.m. here at Connections Church, we are having our Iron Men gathering. We will be continuing the series of Wild at Heart, and you do not want to miss these next sessions. So be here October 17th, 7 p.m. And for our next announcement, Trunk and Treat is right around the corner, October 27th. We are about four to five weeks away, so this is a perfect time for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, anyone you can that will have a great time on that great day. So immediately after the service, we will have food, we will have games for the whole family. So be a part of this, invite anyone you can, get the word out. And for our next announcement, this one goes for all the ladies in the house. September the 27th and the 28th, we will be having our women's conference here at Connections Church. Now ladies, I want you to invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite anyone you can to this conference because I promise you it will bless your life. So put it down in your calendar, September the 27th and the 28th, Women's Conference here at Connections Church. Well, that's all the announcements we have for you this week. If you missed any time today, you can look inside your bulletin for further details. If you are a first time or a second time guest, we want you to know that inside the bulletin, there is a place for you to fill out to let us know that you came by to visit. Well, I hope and pray that you guys be blessed for the remainder of the service, and we will see you next week. All right, a lot going on around here. We tend to have a lot of activity going on. I join in with JJ there. The ladies' conference is this week, Friday night and Saturday. Uh, it's going to be great. If you haven't registered, you still can be a part of that, ladies. I encourage you to be here uh, Friday night, 7 p.m., and enjoy that great time. Uh, Tina Tatum, Pastor Tina Tatum from Mississippi, will be one of the speakers at the ladies' conference. She will be in service with us next Sunday morning speaking in the main service here, and so we're looking forward to that. I wanted to let you know you don't want to miss that time as she is an anointed, uh, powerful speaker of God, and she's going to bless you and bless this house, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so join in uh, with those ladies if you can in any shape, form, or fashion. 
uh, before I dismiss the, the kids, Alyssa, is, is this your last Sunday today for you? It's next, next week? Okay. I, I didn't want to miss it. it. I understood it was coming up. We're going to, Alyssa and Cameron, Cameron is already uh, at his new location with his job, but they're going to be relocating uh, from their job situation, and we wanted to honor them, and we'll do that next Sunday then. Uh, somebody help me remember. I know they've got it written down, but I thought it was today. So I'm going to dismiss the junior high and senior high to their class this morning. They're going to have a wonderful time over there uh, with JJ and Tiffany in Jesus' name. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, I, I want you to go through that with me today with our message. We're going to continue in our series, Better Together. This is the third uh, a lesson of six that we're involved in. And I'm looking forward to the remainder of that. We will skip next Sunday, obviously, with our guest speaker and pick back up the following week or the next three weeks of that. Hopefully, you're going through this in your small groups. If you're involved with that, with the Better Together 40 Days of Community, the other small group we have going on uh, meets right here on Sunday afternoon as soon as service is over with David and Jennifer Metcalf, the Alpha, Alpha course. And this will be the second week of that. If you're not involved uh, with that, that's something you might want to join in on. I know they have food this afternoon, and they're going to set up as soon as service is over right here in the auditorium, and it's a great time of Bible study with that. They had a great time last Sunday, and I know they're going to enjoy that today. But the third edition today of Better Together, 40 Days of Community. I've talked to you about why we need each other, and I've talked to you about reaching out in love last week. It's necessary to connect with one another. Uh, we were created for community, amen? You say, what do you mean by that? Basically, we were wired for relationships. And I'm, I'm not talking about marriage here, okay? Marriage is a big part of our lives, those that are married. But you, you're single or married, you are wired to be in relationships. You were made to be connected one with another. Uh, you were made to go through life together, if I could say it that way. You were made to, to, uh, to have connections one with another, formed for a family. Uh, let's read our text here in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, and it says this, Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected to each other. Look at the one next to you and say, we're connected. You're connected together. God made us not to go through life alone. He made us for relationships. It may be a marriage relationship. It may be a, a, a friendship that's there. It may be a, somebody that you connect with on a level that's a deep, deep relationship and friendship. And God made us to, to be that way. He made us to be wired that way and, and that we need each other in everything that we do. Uh, with that, though, that I have come up, been in this long enough, been alive long enough to recognize that it's easy to get disconnected. We're wired for connections. We're wired for relationships. We're made for community. Community is where people join together uh, in likeness of whatever that may be and accomplish things together. You were made for that. We were made for that. That's, that's one of the purposes of the church body is gathering together on a, on a particular day, whatever day that may be, and connect one with another of like mind and like interests and like things, and we connect one with another so that we have support for one another. You're made for those connections. But it's easy to get disconnected, disconnected from our parents, Disconnected from our brothers or our sisters or our children. Disconnected from our husbands or our wives. It's easy to get disconnected from our church family. It's easy to get disconnected in life. So what causes that? That's, that's where I'm headed with it. What causes relationships to fall apart? What causes uh, relationships or connections to go bad? What destroys those relationships? And then I want to talk to you about how do we rebuild those things? How do we put that back together? Uh, what destroys our relationship and what builds them? And also, how can we build new relationships? I've talked to you in this community-minded uh, uh, concept in this topic for three weeks that part of what we have to do is we have such a tight-knit little circle of life that we operate in that we very seldom step outside of that circle to meet new people, much less invite anybody into our circle. And 
And, and, and the reason is we're comfortable where we are. We kind of like it the way we are. We, we kind of know everybody, and we can get that way in a church too, especially in a smaller church like what we are right now. It can be very easy to say, you know, I kind of like it like this. I know everybody. You know, if somebody comes in, I don't know who they are. And, and what we do, we get kind of closed-minded, and we kind of just say, us four, no more. <laughs> and, and that's not God's plan. Amen? God wants his kingdom to grow. It's not about the numbers, per se, at Connections Church that makes us a success or not. But it is a part of God's growth in his family is that other people that don't know Christ come to know Christ, and the church is is the tool or the vehicle that allows that to happen. So people are going to walk in here. There are those that are going to walk through our doors that that have a past and have a hurt and have a longing and have a desire. They may be full of the Holy Spirit already, but they're looking for a place to connect with like-mindedness and family. We have to open our circle to that and say, yes, you are welcome here and you are loved here. No strings attached. We're going to love you as you walk through the door. That's what we have to be. Why did we call this place Connections Church if we're not willing to connect with anybody? Come on now. Christ makes us one body and individuals who are, say that with me, connected to each other. Have you know that people have differences? Just just look next to you. (laughs) Everybody is different. Thank God. Right? You kind of like yourself, and you look at yourself in the mirror more than you do anybody else, so you must kind of like yourself. But I would hate for everybody to be just like me. (laughs) What's what's the old saying? And and, and God created man, and he sat back, and as he did with every other creation, he said, that's good. But after he created man, he realized he could do better. (laughs) And he made woman. (laughs) Am I right, guys? We won't <laughs> thank God for that. I wouldn't want everybody to be exactly the same, but we're different. And with that difference comes all kinds of new challenges because we're not the same. We don't act the same. We, we, we don't go through life the same way. We don't approach problems the same way. And so there creates challenges in that. And and, and I'll have to tell you this, unfortunately, growing up, uh, we're not taught how to have healthy relationships. I, I don't remember a class in school that taught me how to have a healthy relationship. Amen? It, 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 and hopefully your parents instilled something in you, but many times that, that's not even taught there. It, it, it's, it's not something that is put out there, how to have a healthy relationship, because the fact is, even the parents struggle with that. How do we have healthy relationships? Every one of you in here has dealt with this in some form or fashion, including me. How do we build healthy relationships. What destroys them? I want to identify a few components of what will destroy relationship, and then the complete other side of that table, how do we rebuild a relationship? All right? Everybody with me here today? God wants us to connect with each other. If that is a a promise or a a commandment that he has, then how do we stay connected? Because connection is the key to God's plan in our lives and to grow. So let's talk about that just a minute. Uh, First of all, selfishness destroys relationships. Selfishness. We were all born with a selfish nature. What are some of the first words or things that are spoken by a very young child? Mine, I, me. It's, It's not... They don't come into this world encompassing and, and, and including others in their activities. Do they? That's my toy. <laughs> and and, and if, if it's in their little environment and, and a new child comes into that circle and, and that child goes over to their, it doesn't matter if they played with that toy for the last six months or not. If they go over there and pick up that toy, all of a sudden that child that's in his environment goes grabs it from them. That's my talk. 
we're, we're born with that selfish nature. So self, selfishness destroys relationships. James chapter 4 verse 1 says, what causes fights and quarrels? It says, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. Selfishness causes conflict. It causes arguments. It causes divorce. Selfishness causes wars that are raging in our world. All out of a selfish nature. It's very easy for selfishness to creep into a relationship. And and, and my uh, research, selfishness can be the number one cause that destroys relationships. Proverbs 28, 25 says, selfishness only causes trouble. You know, when you're first, let's go back, those of you that, that are married now. And, and, and you can go outside of that in building any type of relationship. We put a whole lot of time into building that relationship and very little time into maintaining that relationship. That goes for both male and female, but I'm a male, so I'm going to talk about them because uh, I have more knowledge of that. When you're courting your wife, you spend a whole lot more time interested in what she's interested in than you do after you're already married. Maybe you've crossed that bridge already and realized that. If you've been married long enough, you probably have, and you realize that, you know what, this takes some effort. And ladies, from your side, it takes effort to keep a relationship, but we get comfortable in it. And we don't do the same things that we did before we were married. We don't do the same things after the relationship's been established as we did before it was fully established. We spend a lot of time building that relationship at the beginning. And we get kind of, that's human nature. We get comfortable with where we are and who we are. And, and, all, and there's nothing wrong with that. But to maintain a relationship and to keep selfishness out of that relationship, we have to keep working at, I'm going to reach out to the other person and understand what they're going through and try to operate in that way. You know, there's, there's five stages of marriage. And this is not a marriage lesson, but I, I wanted to read this, and I, I, I think it's very unique. There's five stages of marriage, and, and this happens, and this is in what I'm talking about. And it, let me read them here because it was, it was pretty lengthy. Let me go with it. The first year, and I'm not an actor, okay? Baby darling, I'm worried about that sniffle. I've called the paramedics to rush you to uh, Houston Hospital here for a checkup and a week of rest. I know you don't like hospital food, so I'm, I'm having gourmet meals brought into you. That's the first year. Second year. Sweetheart, I don't like the sound of that cough. I've arranged for the doctor to make a house call. Here, let me tuck you into bed. Third year. Anybody noticing any changes already? You look like you have a fever. Why don't you drive yourself over to the medi stop and get some medicine? I'll watch the kids. <laughs> I turn TV on for them. Fourth year. Be sensible. After you fed and bathed the kids and washed the dishes, you really ought to go to bed. Anybody identify? Fifth stage. For Pete's sake, do you have to cough so loud? I can't hear the TV. Would you mind going in the other room while this show is on? You sound like a barking dog. Am I right? They always come in right at the moment something's going on, and, and it's, I can't hear. It's like, why did you have to walk in in that moment? It's like that every single time. <laughs> One guy said in the first year of marriage, my wife used to bring me my slippers, and the dog came barking. <laughs> now the dog brings me my slippers. Selfishness can destroy relationships. Can I get an amen? You know, our, our culture, and uh, culture plays a big part in, in who we are and, and how we do things, the media and what's created. We tend to look at that a whole, whole lot. And there's a, uh, I'm not against this, I love this product myself, but the, the commercial uh, with Sprite, what does it say? Obey your thirst. 
Obey your thirst. That is nothing more than a simple animal urge. Obey what you want to do. Obey what's good for you. Just do what you want to do. Don't care about what, what it might do to anybody around you. If it hurts them, that just, you just need to satisfy yourself. Obey your thirst. That's the culture that we live in. That's the marketing that's out there that infiltrates our mindset and goes right into our being of how we operate. And we tend to carry that throughout everything in our life. Just obey what you want to do. Whatever's good for you, that's what you need to do. Don't care about anybody else. Obey your thirst. What's the other saying that we see? What happens in Vegas? It's okay to be immoral. If you're in Vegas, that's okay. Do what you want to do. It's okay to to operate in a certain way and be unfaithful. what, What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We have a nature that is being infiltrated by this culture and this mindset of everything that's okay for you. If it's good for you, it doesn't matter. And if it hurts somebody else, who cares? Obey your thirst. That's selfishness. Selfishness destroys relationships. So what's the opposite side of that? Well, if selfishness destroys them, what can I use to counteract that or to build them? And it's simply the same word, but it's selflessness builds relationships. What does that mean? It means basically that you're going to look out for somebody else's needs more than yours. You're going to care for others more than you care for yourself. And and the reason I'm talking about it here in 40 days of community or better together, because probably the best place that you learn selflessness is in a family environment. Right? Because if it's just us, and, and, and again, this is not about being single or being married. It's about connecting one with another. But when it's just you you're looking out for, out for you're very selfish because you don't have any other responsibilities. And you tend to keep, take that nature. But we do it in a, in a marriage life too. We go through that whole thing. But when you're in a family, when you're connected one with another, it automatically is going to make you have to operate in a selfless nature. And selflessness will build that relationship where if both of you are looking out for one another. Give and take is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you have to have a give and take mindset because you're up close. When you're in a relationship, you learn about the other person. You learn the good traits and you learn the not-so-good traits. You're up close and personal. You're in their space, so to speak. And it's going to make you, if you're going to continue to have that relationship, it's going to require some selflessness during that relationship. So selflessness builds the relationship. And and what that where that comes into play in, in our lives as far as what we're talking about here today, even with our small groups and with our church family, we have to operate in a selflessness nature. We can't be a self-society in a small group environment or in a church family environment if we want to build that relationship and continue to do so. The scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. Some of us need to adopt that, that nature. What did I say earlier about when I was just speaking to you? Pray the word of God over your life. This is part, God help me to, to look out for other people in my life. Help me to recognize if we're not careful, we just go through life with whatever's going on in our life and we never pay any attention because we're not observant enough to recognize something going on in somebody else's life. Galatians 6, 8 from the message says, the person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others and ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvest a crop of real life and eternal life. What's that say to us? To me, it says God rewards selflessness. God rewards that in our life. Galatians 5, 16 continues, says, live freely, animated, and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selflessness. I wrote down a few things of how we can operate in selflessness. Number one is this, showing up. Some of you just need to be more present in other people's lives. You just need to show up. 
You know, I talked about the first week why we need each other. When there's, when there's sorrow and there's challenge in our lives, you need somebody to stand with you. And many times when there's a loss of life or a tragedy going on, it's not what you say that really makes a difference in that person's life. It's just being there. They know that you're with them. You showed up. And some of us, to have a selfless nature, it's just showing up more often. It's being involved and just being around and letting them know that you care, putting their needs in front of yours. Oh, that's good preaching whether I get an amen or not. <laughs> Accepting new people. I talked about that a while ago. Not being a click. You know, there's nothing wrong with clicks per se, but a click, it, it can take on a negative nature real fast. But accepting new people into your circle. I talked about that in the church. We have to allow new people and accept those new people. The third area of having a selfless nature is listening. Some of us need to listen more. You know what the greatest gift is that you can give? Anybody? Time. Somebody said it. Time. Your time. That's the greatest gift that you have to give is your time, because you're showing them, I care about you. I'm giving up my time for you. Some of you could do that even today. Listening, giving them your attention. And then the fourth area of this, of being in a selfless nature, is offering your help. God has equipped you with abilities and talents, and he didn't mean it for you to use them on you. Wow. He meant, gave those to you so that you could give them out and give them away. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're watching by the internet today, we're glad you're here today. I, I, I need to make attention to that. Stay with us. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Pride. We talked about selflessness that destroys relationships. Pride destroys relationships. Proverbs 13, 10 says, pride leads to arguments. When pride is there, there's a couple of things that show up. Criticism shows up. Judgmental nature shows up. Looking down on the other person shows up. Being picky. It, it's not that you have those problems. You know what the, the base of that is, is you have a pride problem. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, pride will destroy a person. A proud attitude leads to ruin. Listen, we, 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 we dress it a different way. We compare a lot. And we justify that. We compare and, and we look and, and we compare ourselves what she's wearing. What car he drives. The house that they live in. If I only, you know, the, the, in, the income that they have. The lifestyle that they live. We're always comparing to that. It, it, the children that they have or don't have. <laughs> Their titles. That's not the base of the problem. Pride is the base of that comparing problem. Stop comparing yourself to others. God made you to be who you are and the uniqueness that you have. God gave you abilities that you have for a reason. If you will accept that and, and, and allow that to, to just overshadow you and operate with confidence in what God has you, any one of you have the ability to be successful and not success in the eyes of this world, but successful with what God created you to be. The scripture says, first pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Stubbornness is a part of pride. Well, now I'm talking, talking about you. We all deal with this. Man, it's hard to admit you're wrong. Especially in a relationship. Right? You, you'll do everything else that comes to mind before you admit, no, I'm, I'm just wrong. I just messed up. You're right. 
Come on now, ladies. It's hard to say, I'm sorry. I knew you wouldn't shout with me today, but this, this is just, just good, solid things of what we deal with and what destroys the relationships. But it's hard to admit that we're wrong. Uh, this is the way I approach that. You know what that tells me about me? If I'm having trouble saying I'm sorry and that I'm wrong, the reality is, is I'm really too shallow to really care about other people. wow, I don't have any depth about me really that I, I, I can go outside of my own little circle and really care about somebody else. You know, they, they can just, it's me anyway, who cares? <laughs> you know, you're in a, oh boy, here we go. You're, you're in a group of people and, and and, and you all, when I say this, somebody's going to come to mind right away. They always have a story to top your story. Right? They, they, they have to get the last line in. They always have a story that's better than yours. And, and you can see them over there thinking already in their mind. You're telling and they, 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 they got to come up with something. Always offering advice but never listening to any. Wow. That's somebody that, that struggles with saying they're wrong. And it's, it, the issue is pride. And pride destroys relationships. It's self-deceiving. Everyone around them can see that in them except them. Or everyone around us can see it in us except us. Everyone around me sees that except me, and it's self-deceiving. Pride is self-deceiving in its nature, and you will go through life and never really understand that unless you adopt the attitude that, God, I want to be humble in every area of my life. Humbleness builds relationships, the opposite of pride destroying it. If you have a humble nature, the Scripture says in 1 Peter, live in harmony, be sympathetic. Love each other, have compassion, and be humble. It is the antidote to pride. Humbleness. Humble, being humble, being humble allows you to build relationship. There's five things in this scripture. I, I underlined them. Live in harmony. How do we be humble? Live in harmony. How do we be humble? Be sympathetic. Love each other. Have compassion and be humble. As a church family, I think we need to really learn these five. We need to live in harmony as a church family. We need to be sympathetic. We need to love each other. We need to have compassion. And we need to have a humble mentality. If we'll operate in those connections, church, you'll have to lock the door because we, we exceeded our building permit. Capacity, occupancy. They'll be waiting in line as the first church group flows out to get in to get a seat for the second one. Not because of who we are. Not because of, of anything in us. Not because of what I get up here and say. If it was because of what I had to say, it would already be happening. I've been here long enough for it to should happen. It's going to be when we have the nature, all of us, starting with me, that I want to be in a humble nature that God use me. Don't let pride stand in my way and let me recognize that I need to care for others at a greater need than I care for myself. I challenge you this, for this week, do something that will promote humility and harmony. Do something. Challenge yourself in that. Go out and make something. Pair, pair yourself up with someone. Partner with somebody. And allow humility to be a part of your life. Everyone needs a spiritual partner, right? Yeah, everyone but me. That's, that's the way we go through life. I'm okay. And like I said before, if we're not careful and we do this, we accept being good enough. 
is good enough instead of reaching for the greater thing that God has for us. My relationship's good enough. My finances are good enough. My attitude is good enough instead of reaching for the greater that God has. And, and like a, before I started speaking here, the, the first, we limit God to the size of our biggest problem because we accept good enough. Humility builds relationships. Insecurity destroys relationships. I only have four of these, so we're, we're almost done. Insecurity destroys relationships. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of human opinion disables. The fear of what somebody else thinks about me disables me. All I can think about is their opinion. All I can think about is what they think of me. And it disables us. And what it does is makes you afraid to even allow anybody into your circle. And and what what you end up doing, the bottom line of this is, when you operate with insecurity, a a baseline of this, a foundation of this, is it makes you where you want to control the people that are around you. Because you're not going to allow them, you're worried about what they think, and so you limit the activity in reality, you're controlling that environment. And I'm not talking about protecting yourself, don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We limit ourselves to relationships because we let insecurity build a self-imposed prison around us, and we never expose ourselves anymore, And, and again... You've been hurt, you've been mistreated, you've been talked about, and those things are real, and and those things hurt. But if we continue to live that way, you're going to be wrapped in a little bitty box, in a little bitty corner somewhere, like you're in a a, a dungeon, so to speak, and what's what's the worst form of punishment that they put? Solitary confinement. That's the word I was looking for. We all go into solitary confinement, and what happens is we continue to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink, and we don't let anybody in out of fear, and we try to control everything around us, and it's simply because insecurity created that. Insecurity destroys relationships. You were created to have relationship. And your inner soul will long for that. And the more you put that self-imprisoned wall of insecurity around you, you're isolating yourself. You become fertile ground for the enemy just to slam you. And your thoughts and your nature, and we limit God to what's going on around us. You don't really want that, but that's what happens when you let insecurity control. You know, fear. (laughs) When operating in insecurity, we operate of fear. Fear of exposure. Not not physically, but emotionally. We're fear of exposure. And what that happens, the intimate relationship that God wants you to have, you, you, you're hesitant to operate in that because you're afraid if you get too close and there, there's too much of that, then exposure is going to happen of what you really are and who you really are. And so you back away from that out of fear because you can't let that be exposed. And that you long for that intimate relationship. You long for that uh, self type of uh, uh, interaction that you only get from that, but you limit that because of insecurity. And it destroys relationships instead of building that relationship. Fear, listen to me this, fear will make you dishonest. Now I wrote it down this way. You're not living, you're just existing. So what's the antidote of insecurity? It's simply this. Love builds relationships so how does that happen how does love build a relationship when there's insecurity involved and we've already talked about it because you are taking the focus off of you and you're putting the focus on them when you love without strings attached you're taking the attention off of what you want and you're you're searching for what their need is and what they desire and you're focusing on other people love 
builds relationships. 1 John 4.18 says, Love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Some of you need to learn and, and have that scripture in your heart. That perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it shows that his love has not been perfect, perfected in us. So how do I love someone else? So I've been hurt. I've been rejected. I've been just emotionally and physically, maybe physically hurt even. How, how, do, how, how, can I, how can I get outside that? How can I really love that person? This is the base of the Christian life. This is what God created us and how he wants us to be. God says for us to love others, and the number one reason is because God loved us first. And, and the reality is we, we struggle with this, and, and, and I think it's this, because we truly don't understand how much God loves us and, and what he has done for us. And if we will let his love encompass our lives and take over our lives, we'll drop all this area of con control that we're trying to have and all of these relationships, and you are 100% probably right of why you're doing it because you've been hurt and you've been mistreated and you've been beat up, and so you build that wall around you, but you need to allow God's love to sink into your life today and build that hedge of protection around you and allow him to walk before you and behind you, and you reach out and love, say, I'm going to love like God loves me, not because they deserve it, but because God loved me first. You didn't deserve it when God loved you. You know, when you do this, you're going to realize that you don't have to prove yourself anymore. That you don't have to, to impress others. God loves me. Me. Just like I am. He loves me. I, I don't have to worry about what other people are thinking or how, how I need to impress them with what I have or what I don't have or how I act. But God loves me, and I'm going to love in that relationship back. Whether they love me or not, I'm going to show them that God is alive in me, and I'm going to let his love abound in my relationships, and love builds relationships. When you do that, you're going to live life with confidence. You're going to go around saying, I'm a child of the king. And that confidence is going to grow. And, and, and your, your insecurity is going to be defeated. And love is going to abound in you. Take that first step today. The last thing that I wrote down that destroys relationships is this. Resentment destroys relationships. Still talking about better together. 40 days of community. Job chapter 5 verse 2 says, to worry yourself to death with resentment is a foolish, senseless thing to do. Turn around to the person behind you and say, we've all sinned. If you're sitting on the back row, talk to yourself. Or, or, or go to the front row and talk to them because they didn't have anybody say that to them. The reality of this is, guys, none of us can measure up to God's standard on our own, right? My goodness, <laughs> over half the time, you don't even measure up to your own standard of yourself. <laughs> Much less God's standard. None of us can live up to the law of God. None of us are perfect. But... We allow resentment to get involved in our relationships. Psalm 73, 21 says, Since my heart was embittered and my soul deeply wounded, I was stupid and could not understand. Hebrews 12, 15, Look after each other. Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. For as it springs up, it causes deep trouble hurting many in their spiritual lives. The fact of life is you've been hurt, right? If you haven't, you will. 
because we all have gone through this in life. But the more, more important thing to do is this, and more response, and the more uh, important fact about this is, what are you going to do with that hurt? Are you going to allow it to make you bitter? Or are you going to allow it to make you better? Are you going to allow resentfulness to be in your life? Are you going to allow that to control you? And again, this is not a marriage lesson, but have I mean, you know that in, in marriages, or even in relationships, single also, opposites tend to attract. Right? In marriage, this is where this plays out. But it, again, it happens in relationships too. Opposites attract. <laughs> and, and the crazy thing about it is once you've been together for a while, <laughs> well, you do. But the thing that attracted you, <laughs> they're opposite of you, right? Okay? You're living with them now. Okay? You're married. You're together. And the thing that attracted you starts ignoring, annoying, irritating, annoying, bugging you, and I say it that way, upsetting you more than anything else. I'm sure my wife could have a list of things for me that just irritate her about me. We're attracted to it at the beginning. They're not like me, and we're always attracted to something that we're not. But if we're not careful, we start... Uh, resentful. The alternative and the other side of resentment that destroys relationship, forgiveness builds relationships. Colossians 3.13 says, You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember this, and I'm going to talk about this for just a moment. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Stand with me this morning. You know, once... Let me clarify something here, because this can get muddied up a little bit as the band comes. What begins is one thing can lead to resentment if we're not careful. Listen to me this morning. Anger is not always wrong. Let me give you an example. When you see injustice... Say injustice in the world. You see injustice towards your children. Anger is not always wrong. You see injustice towards another human being. It's okay to get angry at that. And situations that come up. Listen to me very carefully. Resentment is always wrong. Resentment is always wrong. Wrong. What happens when you have resentment is you stop thinking clearly. Logic goes out the window. And it's just all about revenge. It's all about make, making them suffer like I suffered. It's all about getting back at them. Let me tell you this, and, and think about it. Some of the most foolish things in history that have been done were done out of resentment. Because you don't think clearly. You, you throw all that logic out the door. And we have revenge and retaliation, resentment. The Bible says this, look after each other. Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. For, it is, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. So why do we... Need forgiveness? Because resentment does not work. And because you have been forgiven by God. You know, forgiveness is not for the, the other person's sake anyway. It's for your sake. You offering forgiveness to that thing that hurts you or to that person that, that did something to you, it, it, it doesn't doesn't benefit that you're not doing anything for them you're doing it for you you know forgiveness is also not making excuses for the person who hurts you it's not minimizing 
the hurt. It's not justifying the hurt. Forgiveness is simply letting go. Letting go. Some of you are still allowing that hurt to bring in insecurity and a lack of confidence for life and a self-imposed isolation and it's controlling you it's not controlling the other person and you're letting things from the past letting things from relationships that have gone bad I know I'm talking to people in here that have gone through divorce or separation or, or loss of friendship and things that people have said and that hurt you. We, we all have dealt with things of that nature. And it still got you so messed up. It's still controlling how you respond to the ones that God's putting in your life today. It's an affecting your relationships that, you're, that you have right now. And they had nothing to do with what happened prior. Forgiveness is the release of that. Forgiveness is for your sake. It's time for you to say, God, I'm not going to allow unforgiveness to rob me of your joy of life. I'm not going to allow for unforgiveness to steal from me the things that you have for my life. Listen, you're, you're here today, which means you're alive and well and breathing. And whatever past has been there, whatever hurt has been there, is exactly that, the past. What did I do, Karen, just said something to remind me. I, I spoke on this before. We tend, driving your car, you, you, you have the windshield, and you have windows all around you, but what do you have in the middle and either side of your car? You have rearview mirrors. You have side that, that are looked behind you. We tend to go through life like driving our car through the rearview mirrors. And you're never looking in front of you. What happens if we did that in reality? It'd be a mess. And we allow that to control our lives and then we start going why is this so messed up and why am I dealing with this and why does this not why can't I get past this why, why? it's just keep, because you're looking in the rear view mirror too much and you're letting unforgiveness dominate you instead of God's love abounding in you and you say I'm going to forgive that individual or forgive that situation for my sake you're not again not for theirs not justifying or minimizing it you've been hurt but God I need to move past that and I want healthy relationships and I want God's love to grow in me and it brings joy and it brings peace and it brings freedom to your life I want I want freedom in my life so I wonder today across this room bow your heads with me if you would Hallelujah, Father. Father, I sense your presence here right now. This simple thought, Father, that relationships are destroyed and what builds them. We need each other. God, I pray for each one here today. If you're here today as your heads bow and say, you know what? This is speaking to my heart. And I've been operating with bitterness in my life. And I want God to change that. I wonder if you just lift your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Hands are going up. Come on, I'm not stopping there. There's more. I want to operate in forgiveness and be free of that. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Thank you. Those of you that had your hand raised, I want you to just simply say, God, I'll release it to you today. <laughs> Father, I'll release it to you today. You forgave me, Lord. And I forgive them for the thing. You know what they've done to you, what they said, what, what they accused, whatever it may be. Where they hurt you, and it's still there. God, God, I forgive them. Thank you for your forgiveness in my life. And God, I give forgiveness to them. 
I promise you, if you'll live that out, if you'll walk in that truth, there's going to be freedom that comes to you that you've never experienced before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We worship you in this house today. Thank you for your word. Let us pray your word over our lives. Let us run towards the destiny that you have for us. The future that's in front of us. The ordained, called, appointed thing that you have for us to accomplish. And Father, don't let us limit you to our biggest problem. But let us, Father, be open to see you as you really are and for who you are. That you're the creator of all things. You're the father of life. You're the giver of salvation. You're the redemption of our soul. You're the forgiveness of our sins, Father. You are life itself. Allow us, Father, just to receive that life right now and completeness and wholeness. Our sinful nature to be forgiven and our sins to be cast as far as the east is from the west. For you to remember no more. Let us drop the past and quit operating from that past and start operating in the today, in the now, and knowing that we are a child of yours and that we claim right to the inheritance that is ours to claim as children of the King. And that we walk in love. Father, because if we make all kinds of accomplishments and we give everything that we have and we say the knowledge that we have, if we do all that and we don't do it bathed in love, we're just making a bunch of noise. Father, I don't want to just be making a bunch of noise. I want to operate with true love, no strings attached. God love shining through me. Hallelujah, Father. We're better together connecting to you and connecting to those around us allow that to happen in this congregation father every day that we live that we connect one with another that we connect one with another in goodness and faithfulness and commitment and love thank you for that today touch everyone that's here father let them be blessed in you let them leave here a changed life not because of me or because of this church, but because of you and their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let your spirit renew us. Let your spirit encourage us. And let us become the encouragement to someone else. Let us become to love the love to someone else. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree trembling beneath the wave. watching by internet today this is out to you allow God to be real in your life 
the way you do that is accepting him as your savior say God I'm going to give up my way to your way and ask him to be a part of your life to be your whole life if you do that today I believe God's going to change your life in Jesus name and I say that to each one of you here today allow God to be the center of everything Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's a good God. He loves us. Amen. We're better together. Go out and make this community better because of your involvement in it. And it's because God's involvement in your life spilling over to that and you affecting the lives that are around you. You can make your world better. Oh, that was kind of weak. You, you can make the world that you're a part of better. Because what lives in you is what they need. And God is always better. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed today. I love you. Thank you for being here. Don't forget about this activities this week. Ladies Conference Friday night. Please, ladies, be here if you haven't registered. I encouraging you to come next Sunday. We're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time uh, right back here in the house of God. 